uh, introducing our guest speaker, Dr. Sandra Hurd. <laughs> She is, she is a professor and director of the School of Library Information Science at San Jose State University. We have some students here, which is great. Um, and our chapter, by the way, really wants to reach out to the students. And so we have, and we're hoping that a number of students do post their YouTube site. And the more we can involve our future, the students are our future, the best, the better. Anyway, um, back to Sandra. <laughs> she has implemented a gateway PhD program at SLIS at Queen's University of Technology in Australia. Um, and prior to joining the school as a director, she worked in the Silicon Valley for more than a decade at major technology companies, HP, I'm sure, <laughs> up here. Um, okay. And Microsoft. Okay, there's Microsoft. As an industry user and experienced researcher, leader, and manager, she contributed to R&D uh, research projects and influenced the user experience of web, mobile, and TV consumer products, resulting in five U.S. patents. She was previously an assistant professor at the University of Arizona and has taught courses for San Jose State University and the University of Washington. I, we were talking at the table, and she does all of this and more in addition to having two teenage daughters. <laughs> Is that how great it is? Anyway, Sandra, welcome you tonight. Thank you. Thank what we've been working toward in the school over the past year. And then also think forward and uh, share with you some of the ideas that we have, some of the directions that we're pursuing for the future. So um, this is really a pleasure to be able to talk to you about all of this stuff. It's all near and dear to my heart, and um, so it's exciting to be able to share that with you. Um, as Vicki mentioned, I've been now the director at the School of Library and Information Science at San Jose State University for uh, just over a year. It's been about 15 months since I took that home um, in August 2010. And as I mentioned, it's been an extremely hectic and busy year. Um, for those of you who, oh, I can open up my slides. Let me do that, get that open really quick. And move on, here we go. Um, and uh, for those of you who don't know, our school is actually the largest school of library information science in the world. We have more than 2,300 graduate students, um, and they live uh, in uh, all across the United States and in um, many countries as well. I'll show you a map in a second. And um, we've been ranked uh, number one by the U.S. News and World Report for our excellence in online e-learning in library information science. Uh, one of the things that we're very excited about that just happened in May is that we graduated our very first cohort of students in our um, a smaller program that we have, the Masters in Archives and Records Administration. Our very first cohort graduated. So that was exciting. Thank you for our And one of the other things that I've been really thrilled about, um, those of you I'm sure are all reading all the time about the very tight, um, terrible budget crisis that the state of California is in, and certainly the California State University system has been in, and we have been very fortunate to be in a position to be actually hiring faculty um, and um, hiring staff in this uh, tight budget crisis, which means that there's a lot of confidence in our program and the value that our program has given us delivering to the university and to the professional community. And so we've been able to continue to grow and invest in our program. And that's also exciting um, that we've been able to maintain the strength of uh, the numbers of students that we've been able to do in this uh, very uh, competitive and uh, tight job market and um, uh, where people are very concerned about their futures 
and also where a lot of other schools are moving into an online environment. So this has been a um, very exciting time for our school. So just, uh, just so you can get a visual image, we have, do have students in 48 states, and, we have, and they live in 18 countries. So they're very distributed across the world, which makes for very enriching conversations in our student, in our, in our class, the classrooms, and really diverse experiences. And not only are our students diverse, but our faculty is very diverse as well and distributed. Because we are fully online, we're able to draw faculty from around the world so that they can deliver their expertise in our program no matter where they live. So we feel that's a real benefit for our students. However, <laughs> I thought I'd start out with a little perspective um, about uh, some of the challenges that have kind of, uh, coming from industry. What are some of the things that you think I might have walked into? Um, or what do you think might have been my greatest uh, challenge walking into uh, to a university environment after working in industry for 10 plus years at companies like you've heard? Your obviously is a good one. <laughs>
this I need sixteen hundred dollar a handheld barcode scanner to finish my lab test. Okay, apply for a capital budget variance, prepare an RFP, get three bids, form a team to evaluate the bids, then prepare a purchase order. And he says,
that I spoke with you a lot about that back in February. My keynote that I made at the Library 2.0 in one conference was very much targeted to this topic. And um, we've been putting a lot of resources and energy behind this because I think this is something that's very important for um, uh, our profession is to be thinking about, you know, in this top, in this top market and, and the like. It's not that there's not, it's not that there's not opportunities for people with library information science degrees. It's just that we need to be thinking creatively and differently about what those, what those options and opportunities are. And I'll talk a little bit more about that later. But um, one of the things that we've done to help students think about the careers and opportunities is that we've just launched this fall a careers colloquium. These are open actually for everybody, and they're free. So if you're interested, they're fully online that we offer via Illuminate. And what these are aimed to accomplish is we're bringing in different people and different um, that to talk about different kinds of careers. So the first ones we did, and did a series around federal federal libraries and agencies and opportunities in the federal in the federal um, realm. And then we've had other, we're bringing in other speakers as well. That is the first one. And we've had Kim Doherty and Scott Brown talk about opportunities in library information science as well. And that's going to continue. So that's one thing that we've been doing. Another thing is I recommend, if you haven't already, that um, we've developed and invested heavily in our career pages, career development pages on our website. It's very robust. There's a lot of information. ALA actually links to our site now because we've done such a thorough job of collecting really valuable information and presenting it there. So that's something that I, um, that I think is as valuable. I want every student that goes through our program not to say that you know when they go through this that they have every resource and have had all of the training and put the thought in to enable them to be successful when they graduate. And that's my goal. So there's a lot of resources for them to use. We have a careers consultant that can, they can meet with to help develop their resume and to um, get tips about interviews. They can meet with personally one-on-one. -on -one. We also offer um, a monthly tip um, as presentations about like, how to do interviews, how to handle tough interview questions, um, and, and the like. And then the other, one of the other things we did this year is we also um, changed from our specializations pages, we used to have specializations, and we changed them into career pathways. They were never true specializations in the true sense of what a specialization was anyway, they were really recommendations. So we revised that and turned them into career pathways and updated the content and refreshed it to reflect what we understand about what the market is and where you know what the opportunities are. Those have been fully redone and um, so those are um, nice because they talk about the kinds of jobs you can get and also link to stories that we do of our students and alumni to show how people in that space, like special libraries, has is one of the career pathways. And, it, and we have a number of stories tied to what our alumni and students are doing in the special library space, and they can get some examples of that as well. One of the other things that we're doing that uh, is um, something we've been really focusing on a lot more in this past year is um, the idea of virtual internships. And um, this is something where we are taking the idea of being virtual and distributed, and the fact that work is naturally, uh, and many, many of your work is, is often done in a distributed way, and to um, take those opportunities that are internship opportunities where it makes sense to match the students with the skill sets and interests to those opportunities, no matter where they are physically um, in the geography sense. So, so um, we have set up a really um, interesting, uh, interesting internship, virtual internships, for example, at Credo Reference, and they love our students, and they keep coming back for more. And we have one in Dubai, and we have um, them in many different kinds of libraries as well. So that's something for you guys to think about as well, if you have um, internship opportunities, and it makes sense for you for the work that's being done that it can be thought of in a virtual way. It's not all work is naturally fits that. Then you should think about that because we love, we're looking to build those up more and more. Another one of the of areas that we've been focusing on this year is in terms of developing uh, new education programs to meet professional needs. And one of the things I think we talked about last February was there were some questions around what we're doing for people beyond the degree in library and information science. And we talked about the importance of lifelong learning and, and retooling your career um, and continually learning and investing in your um, education. And we heard that message. And so I'm really pleased. This is really very new. Just to like a couple of weeks ago. I have a very enthusiastic supporter here. Um, I'm so 
able to have announced that we just launched a postmaster degree certificate program that is fully online. And we mapped it to five of our career pathways that I mentioned we did before, and it's these five. And we just announced it at the California Library Association a few weeks ago, and we're already getting fantastic response and interest in the program. So I'm really thrilled because I think that this really this rounds out our um, our um, school library and information science programs. We have something to offer people um, um, and as they're starting their career and also as they're in their career and are looking to continue to advance it and learn it and grow it. So those are the five areas that we offer these postmaster certificates in. Of course, it's all fully online. Um, the other thing that we've done to optimize for our um, um, to remove ourselves fully online and virtual, we've embraced that 100 percent, and we've taken what we've been doing already, which is offering a colloquium series where we bring in speakers of interest. In fact, we've had um, Olivia come and we've had uh, many um, Robert Summer come. Now, in mo mo what we used to do, and what we did in that particular case, was um, we actually had people come physically to our school and present in a physical environment. We videotaped it and made it available later. What we're now doing is we're using our a web conferencing platform, Illuminate, to offer these classes and these um, these uh, sessions in real time, so that everybody can participate, no matter where they are. And we make it open not just to our students and to our faculty, but to the whole professional community. So these are things, opportunities for everybody to engage and continue to hear what the latest thinking is in different topics and areas. So, um, so you should pay, and you can watch for that. We send out announcements about those talks. And another thing that's really um, interesting that I think we're, we launched this, this just recently, just this fall, is that we're now doing um, working to prepare our students for functioning in the multicultural world that we are living in. And what we've done is we've partnered with the World Languages Department to create custom classes for our students in uh, language classes that are tailored to working in library and library and information environments. So we have these custom classes in Spanish and French that our students now can take that are offered to our students that are tailored specifically for the needs and interests of our of, uh, of library environments. So we started that just this, this fall at a beginning level. We've been at an advanced level classes in those areas and we're hoping to add the as well. So this is something new that we've just launched too. So the other, so another area that we've been focusing on this year in terms of our vision is in terms of expanding our partnerships. And we've been busy in that regard as well. And um, we have um, established, I mentioned a few things here in terms of working on a global partnership. Um, we have an interesting partnership that we're doing with Vietnam National University right now. Um, I got a grant to do research on um, assess how do you assess readiness for moving into an online educational environment? How do you know when you're ready? And uh, so we are doing research with um, Vietnam National University in Library and Information Science and Social Work to determine, um, create the kind of rubric or benchmark for assessing that and working with them to, um, to help them move in that environment when they're ready. They're not quite yet, but we're studying and researching that. That's kind of interesting partnership. Um, I also have another grant, actually, that is, I have another flyer for as well, if you're interested. And this is with um, the ILS funded grant. And this is in partnering with OCLC, ACRL, PLA, and ULC. And this is uh, for the Catalyst Project. And this is really neat because this kind of blends with the idea of how do we leverage the, the, the great skills that our recent graduates of library information science have. And because of many of our students as they go through this program, develop um, recent skills in emerging technologies. And what is one of the things that many libraries are having trouble adjusting to is emerging technologies. And what if we marry the two together and provide match up recent graduates with these skill sets to libraries who need um, that kind of emerging technology skill sets and create a residency program that would benefit our um, um, academic and public libraries. So we have a planning grant that I am most funded and we have all these fantastic partners working with us to do that. If you're interested, there's a lot of ways to be involved in that, so I have some flyers about that as well. I'm happy to talk more about that. So, oh, and then we have a lot of interdisciplinary partnerships. Um, with social work, with world languages, as I mentioned, and we're also partnering with business and health sciences. So um, the third, the last thing I think I mentioned as part of our vision for the, 
what we've been working on in this past year is in terms of using emerging technologies for community building activities. One of the criticisms I've heard since I've taken on the leadership role is that it's hard to have a sense of community in an online program. And it's really hard to make those kinds of connections with, each, with other people. And so hearing that, one of the ways that we responded is by, um, is by implementing some new technologies we just launched this fall. Um, and one of them is uh, Blackboard Instant Messaging, um, Blackboard AM, which you have a little picture up here. It doesn't show its full capabilities, but this is a really neat um, uh, technology that is enabling us to take kind of that sense of distance out of distance education. And we're doing that by providing this, um, this where um, it, it actually automatically puts all our students by class in, um, so you can see, communicate easily and readily by IM or other communication with your peers in your class and with your instructors. And it gives the instructors an opportunity to create actual office hours and holding rooms or the waiting rooms where people can wait. And it also allows people to do videos, video chat um, communication, as well as ad hoc kind of whiteboard activities. This is meant to supplement our, our use of web conferencing platform, which is a heavier, more uh, structured, you know, kinds of more heavy use. This is for the ad hoc random communications. As if you're sitting next to somebody in class and you see that they're online, you can reach out to them and have that kind of conversation. And it's really starting to break down those barriers and make people feel closer together. Some of the other things that we're doing in terms of community building in terms of technology is we've launched um, open houses that are virtual for our, and for, for our prospective students of all types. And these have been wonderful and they're really giving people an opportunity to see what our, um, our environment is like. We hold those also using Illuminator web conferencing platform. And then we follow up with things via blogs so they can keep track of it, um, what's going on in our school. So we're using all different kinds of media to make people feel like they belong and that they're part of um, part of uh, at the school. And then we also have very robust Twitter, Facebook, and LinkedIn um, uh, pages and uh, we're, that we're posting to all the time. And we're really increasing our Twitter use as well. Um, and so there's a lot of engagement. So those are some of the things looking back. That is not everything that we've done, but I think that's a lot. <laughs> we've uh, have, have been really uh, pleased with where we, what we've been able to accomplish. But I, I wanted to also take um, the time at this event to also look forward. So we've reflected back. Let's take a chance and some time to look forward. And I thought I'd share very briefly with you some of the trends or issues I see coming up in higher education, which is the world I'm living in right now and um, library and information science education and kind of how I see things changing there. And then what I see is how things are changing for library and information science career prospects and what's going on in that area. And then some of the future plans for, um, for what, we're, what we're doing. So that's what I'm gonna do now. So some of the things I see in higher education and I think these are pretty common things that as far as I can tell I'm talking to other people and what I read in the literature. Um, so the first thing is that the higher education, the state economy is a mess and um, that affects public, and public universities very heavily and, and hardly uh, in a very hard way in terms of, um, you know, we've been seeing that student fees are being hiked up all the time as a way to bridge the financial gap that they're, um, that we're, that is being, you know, that we're, that we're facing. There's fewer courses for them to take. Um, there's costs that they charge um, you know, the budgets are not getting any bigger. And um, there's been extremely limited faculty hiring. Um, and there's just fewer jobs. So I mean, it's kind of bleak. It doesn't feel so great being in that environment. That said, I did say that um, our university has been investing in us. I will give you, just so it helps you put it in perspective with what I'm talking about, the San Jose State University, um, the year I was hired in 2010, there were only three hires, faculty hires that year. I was one of them and I was a replacement. So just, okay, so but we, our school was one of three hires that year. In 2011, there were only 11 faculty hires for the entire university campus. We got one of them. So I think that's amazing <laughs> that we were been successful in, in negotiating that. And this year, while the hiring is more, if you think about the years of starvation, it really doesn't do anything much to um, make much of a dent. They're hiring 40 um, faculty positions 
at the university, and uh, we still got one. So I think that's really, um, I think we're the only unit I know of at San Jose State that has been given, allowed to hire every year in the past, you know, in the past several years. So that's great that the university is supporting us and is investing in us and recognizes our value. Um, but, you know, I'm out there fighting for faculty positions all the time. Um, one of the other things that we see um, in terms of uh, where higher education is going, and I have them all listed out here, and this is pretty much pretty standard <laughs> for any higher education institution. And you might have your own favorite things to add to the list too, but these are the ones I'm seeing from where I sit. And um, is that you know uh, increasing focus on research contributions, even at a California State University, um, which has traditionally focused on teaching, is now very much focused on research and is much more um, you know, measuring people on their success in research. So that's an interesting trend um, to watch and to see. Um, there's a huge focus on interdisciplinary connections, huge. And um, in fact, our hire that we got approved for this year is an interdisciplinary hire. And what we're hiring is in the area of informatics that is going to be interdisciplinary with another unit. And we left it open to let the see who was out there to see um, what kinds of candidates we would get um, and where they might feel like their interdisciplinary connection would best fit. And we have a really good range. Um, I can't say a lot about it because we're interviewing our last candidate tomorrow. But um, I, we uh, have had a great uh, response to that position. And it'll be interesting to see how um, we move forward with that. It's kind of a new model for the university. And we're at the forefront of that, of that moving in that direction. So um, definitely moving into an inter interdisciplinary world. Um, STEM. Uh, you know, that's uh, just a bigger focus. Our, our new president at the university um, came from uh, Cal State East Bay, um, has a big STEM focus, and I um, you know this is true even you know, with my counterparts at Queensland University of Technology in Australia, that they're moving in that direction as well. Um, consolidation and cost planning. Gone are the days when there's lots of standalone university units. Everybody's moving into larger and larger units into uh, consolidation. Um, and uh, and nobody and people are looking for alternate revenue sources as well. So that's going to continue. And nobody thinks that the state budgets are going to come back to uh, any kind of previous levels. So um, there'll be uh, continuous looking for new opportunities and grant opportunities or donations or the like. Um, our school, because we have the online model that we've been on, is, is fortunate for us, and so that's, that's been helpful. Um, the other thing is the globalization, the focus on the international and um, globalization of education is continuing, and um, there's an increasing focus on online education, and it's not just in our field. And um, our new president is focusing on, on online uh, learning, and so there was an interesting uh, Pew study that I was just reading the other day that I was going to share with you. That um, they were saying that 77, and this just came out in 2011, that 77 percent of the college presidents say that they, their institutions already are offering online classes. That's a staggering statistic if you think about that. And um, there's just been an increasing enrollments and growth in online education at the undergraduate level, and certainly we have it at the graduate level. So that's a very quick, high-level uh, summary of higher education realities. Now switching to library and information science education, um, similarly, there's been a huge, I mean, huge <laughs> movement into uh, online education and library and information science. So if you think about this, I'm going to put this in perspective for you. We, uh, our school made the decision to go fully online in fall 2000, we implemented in fall 2009. That's two years ago. We were the first and uh, definitely a pioneer at that time. Nobody in our field was doing anything that radical. Now, a third, fully a third of the accredited schools of library and information science are claiming to be fully online. Now, I think that when that has to be taken a little bit with a grain of salt because they're fully online doesn't always mean fully online. Oftentimes they have a brief residency at the beginning or something like that, but as stated, I'm just reporting the statistics that's reported on the sites. Um, almost a third of the schools are fully online, and then another 
with 11 of them are um, partially in line. When you take that together, it's 57% of the schools of lab and information science are online, either partially or fully. That's amazing <laughs> numbers. And let me tell you, that's not changing. And that's going to keep moving forward. So it's going to be some big changes in the profession, I think, as we look forward and think about how people are going to be getting their library and information science education and what that means and how people make their choices. It will be definitely a change landscape. Another thing I wanted to mention is that it's been interesting to watch. This is a, uh, also a very recent change. Is, um, in 2005, there was the launch of the iSchool movement, and um, that's six years ago. And as of today, I just looked, there are up to 33 members in nine countries. So very interesting to see that. What kind of impact that will have on other kinds of schools of library and information science and what that really means and what they add to it in terms of their advocacy and kind of education that they do in terms of broadening people's mindset about what information, library information science really means. There's also been a lot of focus on new curriculum areas. Um, I mentioned just a few in terms of data, digital curation, emerging technologies, informatics, digital preservation, and lots of interdisciplinary topics. When I look at the job lists um, for hiring new faculty, these are often areas that you see them in. They're, when they're creating new degree programs, it's often in the areas of areas like health informatics or you know digital curation or things like that. So these are definitely kind of the areas of future <laughs> that people are focusing on. And then there's been this increase, um, you know, a demand for continuing professional development. And there's been a huge growth in the amount of options I think that people have to get that professional development education in terms of little workshops and webinars and things that are offered online, um, you know, uh, all different, info people, web junction, ALA, like you name it, there's so many different options for people to, to get retooled and to refresh and many people feel the need for that because so many of the things are changing so quickly and what they learned in their library school program is probably a cloud dated and so they're feeling that and they need to be competitive, they need to retool. So um, one of the things in now shifting gears looking forward in terms of what I see as the career prospects for people with library and information science degrees. Um, I, I still, I was still I'm fairly optimistic on this, on this point because I do see that there are opportunities, even though there's a lot of negative discussions that are held on that. But one of the things that I think is interesting is this um, from the Library Journal Placements and Salary Survey um, that came out in 2011 is this, you know, this idea that jobs in private industry continue to be lucrative for new library information science graduates. And uh, those are up and are growing. So there are definitely areas, of the hot spot areas, for, where there are opportunities for people with the library and information science skill set. Now, I think I talked about this last time. This is something that we do um, every year. We do an annual jobs audit. And our school takes a look at job postings every year and we, um, for people with library and information science backgrounds. And we do some research to see kind of what the trends are in terms of what are the skills Or what are the trends and opportunities for students um, who are in a program and looking for future opportunities? So this is reflecting our updated jobs audit that we just completed in August 2011, so fairly recently. And um, this is, so this shows um, that some of the things that we've identified as um, kind of the knowledge that people are looking and recruiting for focus around areas like metadata. Um, instruction and technology, so especially in the integrated libraries and um, systems and Web 2.0 applications, and that there's still an interest in um, people with experience and reference. Um, and uh, so there, this is just interesting for us to see what kind of expertise is in demand. And then if we take a look at the um, at the emerging job titles that um, for people who want to work in a library setting. There are many different um, opportunities for the, the work trends that we're seeing in that regard, with an increased focus around metadata, emerging technologies, e-learning services, um, digital collections and initiatives. And so there's um, definitely a need to leverage expertise with the latest technologies to help integrate um, that into library settings, which is why I think this Catalyst project I think is going to be interesting and a great opportunity 
for a recent grad. Um, then if we take a look at the emerging job titles that for non-library setting, um, it's interesting because these job titles don't have the word librarian in them, but yet they're le leveraging a lot of our core um, skill sets and just in different ways, and um, especially leveraging our deep understanding of the and user needs and technology in, in positions like social skills, media liaison, or usability analysts. And, um, the, and our expertise in research skills and um, analysis can be seen and can be useful for some of the jobs like business intelligence analyst and information specialist. And then uh, so using some of our expertise in information organization and user needs, those can be um, well mapped to positions like information architect, web content, um, web content manager, and media taxonomist. So there seems like there's a lot of good opportunities for, um, I think, uh, for people who with uh, degrees in our, uh, in, our, in our library information science. So let me switch gears and, and talk a little bit about what I see coming up for this list um, in the coming year. Um, these are some of the things that we're going to be working on. Um, one of the things I've been very interested in doing, and it's been an idea I've been wanting to do, even since I was on the International Advisory Board for the school, is to develop um, this a center, a research center for the school, um, where you have named it the Center for Information Research and, Inter and Innovation, and where we're at right now, and we're going to be launching it as a virtual research center, and we're defining it and working on it, but this is going to be a vehicle that I'm hoping that we'll be able to develop partnerships with people like you, and um, a different um, uh, Silicon Valley companies, with um, uh, other libraries, with the state library, with government agencies internationally to work collaboratively on research problems and um, and uh, and to uh, advance our learning in different areas. So we're looking forward to launching this and also showcasing some of the work that we're already doing in, in terms of research, which this will be a good home for our student research journal, for example, some of the work that our gateway uh, PhD students are doing, our doctoral students, some of the back and grants that we've been getting that I think you know, don't really have a good home. So this will be another way for us to represent some of that as well. So I'm looking forward to creating that, and so stay tuned, there'll be a lot more information. Um, there, we're also going to be focusing on increasing our partnerships. I think partnering is a, a really important way for us to continue to learn and grow together. So um, we will be doing that, that will, as I mentioned, will be one of the things I'm hoping that we can achieve even uh, with greater success um, when, when we have our research center established. Um, you'll be seeing increased, um, continuing global uh, engagement. You'll see the Library 2.012 conference coming, and we'll be doing other kinds of research partnerships and, and international engagements um, going forward, and participation in international conferences, engagement in the international arena, so you'll be seeing that as well. Um, the other thing that we're working on, and actually we're just about done with, but it'll take us time to, to uh, transfer all of our content, is um, a web redesign, which I'm excited about, because I think it'll give us an opportunity to, um, to reach out and to uh, interest a broader range of people that rather than our current students. And I think we do offer a lot to other people, so um, I think that it'll be better represented in the new design, so that's coming. And um, the other thing is I'm hoping to continue to increase our student and alumni engagement. We've already done a lot in that regard. Um, one of the things I'm, I'm thrilled about is that we've resurrected our um, ACES student chapter um, this year, and it is going gangbusters. They are just going great. I'm hoping that we can get a student chapter for SLA resurrected. Um, and I think that would be fantastic if we could. Um, the other thing that we have done that I think is um, interesting is that um, we have a unique model where we recently uh, combined our student association and our alumni association into a single association. And um, they have are just you know, finished you know, kind of working out the details and I'm looking forward to uh, an interesting and productive relationship to think about what, how students and alumni can uh, benefit uh, from each other. And so that will be uh, coming up as well. And, uh, oh, the other thing is, and, and just so you know, just even our existing student chapters continue to be successful, which I think is amazing. Um, in an online, fully online environment, our ALA student chapter has won student chapter of the year 
twice, and this year was ALA's two chapter runner up nationally. So I think that's incredible um, because, again, people tend to think that it's hard to build a community and be successful in a non fully online environment, yet our student chapter has managed to do that time and time again. And I can tell you the ACE student chapter is really off to a great start. So I'm looking forward to and hoping we can get it this SLA student chapter up and running as well. And then finally, I'm um, looking forward to the continued excellence in library information science education and also in um, information and help building up our strength in information science education as well. Um, I, my recent hires have been in that area, emerging technology and about to be in the informatics space. I think that it's important for us to have a really well-balanced offset of offerings to our students that map across library science and information science. We're already very strong in library science and I want to be equally strong in information science. So that's what we're working on. It's not to trade off one against the other, it's to make them strong across the board. So um, that's what I'm working on as well and we'll continue, you'll see continued investments in that space. So in conclusion, um, I left you this quote last time and I'll leave it with you again. <laughs> Um, is to say the future is not some place we're going, but one we're creating, and the past to are not found but made. And the activity of making them changes both the maker and the destination. And um, I think that this has been an amazing journey, this first 15 months on the job, and um, I think we have a uh, really, um, uh, I think, an ambitious and um, exciting path to the future, and I'm hoping that you will join me and help me make that a great destination. Close to 
to how we are. In fact, we're held up as the model on campus for how where the, the, you know others should be following. Where else does a library information science program get to be the model? I mean, that's pretty unusual to be held up like that, but we are continually held up like that. So others will come. But, so I think until that time, we're a little bit um, limited, to be honest. Uh, well, I, I don't know about the Dubai one. I can't answer that one, but um, the Vietnam one I can answer. Um, so uh, I don't know how many of you know that San Jose, as a community, has a very large Vietnamese community, and um, and our school of social work has um, as one of the few social work uh, Vietnam PhD trained. I think the only one with Vietnamese trained um, social worker. And so there's been actually connections that within my college, um, the social works in my college, that they've made with Vietnam National University and many other institutions in Vietnam from a social work perspective. And they've actually helped the country develop their very first social work degrees. It's a whole new discipline out there in, in Vietnam and a very important one because of AIDS and all sorts of other kinds of diseases. So they have, um, so they've been doing that. And um, when on one of their visits, when they were out talking about social work things, they said, oh, we'd be interested in you know, developing a partnership in library and information science. And it was through that and through our umbrella MOU that our, our college already had that I was able to leverage that to make those inroads and connections to Vietnam. It's a little long-winded answer, but it's how it happened. Because it is a little bit like, huh? How did you end up in Vietnam? That's how. Um, and it's been a great partnership and a really interesting environment to do it because, um, you know, uh, we've seen in the United States this really pretty rapid shift right now in terms of moving into online education, certainly in our profession, and then I'm seeing it more broadly, and it's just all coming. But it's interesting to see kind of the reactions in other countries to online education. There's a lot of uh, fear and trepidation and um, mistrust, and um, so it's not just a technology infrastructure that needs to be in place, but there needs to be a readiness for it um, in terms of the attitudes and perceptions of what online learning do. Um, so it's interesting to see what's happening in Vietnam, and even if I've been there twice now in this past year, um, I've been on 20 trips, it's been very, when I was talking about some of the challenges, the Justin's travel has been one of them, but um, I went to Vietnam twice, and in that time period, I went to Vietnam in like end of February, at the beginning of March, and then I went back in September, and already the amount of change that's happening there is dramatic in terms of, in every way, including, you know, kind of, mindset and, and reactions to online learning. Anyway. Sure. So then are classes held in English or do you do simultaneous translation or both Vietnamese? So we're not doing classes right now, so we're not, so my, my idea had been to, my original idea was like, well, that'd be great if we could offer classes in other countries, but the reality is that that's challenging for a number of reasons. Um, not to mention that we don't offer classes in Vietnamese, but um, and they are come out of English, they know it's not so much. So, um, so then I thought it would be neat if I we partnered through like our research center that we could we do that as a as an uh, effort to help other countries or other places develop online learning because we really have it down pretty well and we want to continue to innovate and help others do that. Like be the consulting or grant funded work that we could do. But now when I went out there, it was clear that they weren't ready for that yet because of infrastructure reasons, but also these attitudinal and perception issues too. So then that switched it to, let's do some research to assess how you determine when you are ready to move in that environment. So it's been interesting, so we've been doing a year of research there with stakeholder interviews and technology assessment and um, focus group interviews with different groups, people in the community, professionals in the community, with students, with the faculty, administrators, and the likes. It's really interesting, I think. Me. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, before I was laid off of Roche, um, the information scientists were working within the bioinformatics group. So now that you're having getting into the informatics area more in depth online, how do you see yourself um, interacting with the bioinformatics division at San Jose State? Well, um, so the, and that's a big question. I, mean, I, I think that 
we're going to make when higher. I mean, in informatics right now, so it's kind of growing, right? So um, that was going to come with their own specific area of interest, which may not be in bioinformatics, but might be in um, it might be in social informatics. It could be, and like there's in computer informatics, it could be a whole different area. So there may or may not be an immediate tie-in right away to bioinformatics, and if I'm understanding your question correctly. But it might be something that we've been developing over time. So we'll have to see how that goes and the kind of skill sets that the person ended up hiring and what kind of connections we are able to start building from that on campus going forward. Does that, did that answer the question? Sure. Okay. okay. Guys, Amy, it was so much fun to talk about this school. I could talk forever. <laughs> Hope I didn't talk too long.